So I intended to do this a while before, but just various things um, kind of prevented me from doing it. But I did want to spend some time for the next two to three weeks on science, politics, and Gnosticism. It's a small book by Eric Boglin. Um, and I have found it to be a really good introduction to the ideas of Eric Boglin, where you don't get into a lot of the, um, the language barriers regarding Vogelin. Vogelin um, came up with his own lexicon, basically, which, uh, which is somewhat justifiable given the concepts he's trying to convey, but it makes it doubly hard for people to um, figure him out right off the bat. So for instance, if you read um, the New Science of Politics, which is what I would recommend if, if you like this type of um, content, you would have to get, um, you would have to take some time to just sort of grapple with some of his um, references, such as immunitizing the eschaton. Um, <laughs> but anyway, like in this book, you don't have to deal with that so much. It's basically two essays by Vogelin, both of them relatively short. Um, the entire book is about 100 pages, a little less actually. So it would be a great um, introduction for instructors that just wanted their students to know the basic ideas, political ideas of Vogelin. Vogelin, Vogelin is a 20th century political thinker. Uh, there's a Vogelin Institute at Louisiana State University. Um, and that is where he uh, worked for quite some time. So Vogelin is probably most famous for reconceptualizing Gnosticism and applying the concept of Gnosticism to 20th century mass movements. Of course, he was dealing the same with a lot of other thinkers from this time period. He was dealing with the big question of how humanity got to the point um, where these highly violent, destructive mass movements, such as Nazism, fascism, and communism, um, how did they get their start and where did they get their juice, their, you know, capability of, of um, you know, leading so many people down such a destructive path? Um, and he clearly, um, you know, in this introduction to this small book, he clearly um, has grappled with this himself prior. So he mentions his own book, New Science of Politics, um, and he also mentions some other authors that have grappled with the concept of, you know, like secular religion and this type of stuff. And he's not, he doesn't want to um, distance himself uh, from these other um, authors or the whole idea that perhaps these movements are like secular religions, but he does want to go deeper and to try to explain that, that this is, um, something that has its roots much further back in history, I guess you might say, than what they would think, right? Like, oh, oh, my own scholarship tends to revolve around, you know, what happened in modernity, right? And it's not that Vogelin doesn't ask the question, what happened in modernity, but he doesn't focus as much on just that modern moment of, say, the 16th century onward, but, but he looks back to um, changes in even in the ancient world um, as sort of a root um, that he can then uh, use to understand these contemporary uh, phenomena. So um, this book was written in 19, or published in 1968. Um, it is informed by his previous research um, in New Science of Politics, which was published in 52. It's grappling with the violent mass movements of the 20th century, which he is willing to refer to as ersatz religions. Um, and he says in the introduction, there was talk during this time period in the 20th century, as, as they were trying to figure this out, there was talk of neo-pagan movements, of new social and political myths, or of mystique politique. I too tried one of these ad hoc explanations in a little book on political religions. So he is wanting to move forward here um, and develop the idea of applying Gnosticism, the idea of Gnosticism, which is a very ancient movement to the mass movements of his time. 
Um, so, for instance, in the introduction, he refers to the cosmological civilizations of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Egypt, as well as for the peoples of the Mediterranean in the seventh century before Christ, and that they inaugurated this age of ecumenical empires. Um, and what that refers to is just the, the idea that these empires rose up much more powerful than the ones that came before them, and with the goal of basically encompassing as much of the world as they possibly could. That's what he means by ecumenical empires. Ecumenical sounds nice, but in this case, I don't think he means it that way. Um, these empires rose up, and they try to conquer others of different religions and different languages. And, and the power of people at this time then created a lot of turmoil amongst the populations. So he says, the interpenetration of cultures reduce men who exercise no control over the proceedings of history to an extreme state of forlornness in the turmoil of the world of intellectual disorientation of material and spiritual insecurity, the loss of meaning that results from the breakdown of institutions, civilizations, and ethnic cohesion evokes attempts to regain an understanding of the meaning of human existence in the given conditions of the world. Okay, so in a nutshell, he's saying at a time of destructive empires that are fighting amongst themselves, fighting um, to gain territory, and cultures are mashing together as, as, a, as a result of, of this movement of these wars. Um, and, you know, government is getting bigger and bigger in people's lives. People, ordinary people are reduced to this um, sort of helplessness, uh, radical insecurity, that they don't have control over their own fate, that violent, violent uh, armies might just come through and, and take away everything that they have. They're being confronted by people with very different ideas, languages, and religions, and so on. And in this environment, they want something, anything that will help them regain, as he says, an understanding of the meaning of their existence. How am I supposed to see myself in this new world? How do I make sense of it? Where do I belong in it? And so this was a, what he's saying is this was a milieu, a, 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 a context in which um, a lot of people would be drawn to a way of thinking that tried to give them the key a key to understanding everything that was going on and a way of kind of grappling with it and maybe even attempting to control it or at least control their own fate within this larger context. So he says among these efforts, right, the effort to kind of regain control, which he does not completely identify. They're like Gnostic adjacent movements, I guess you would say. He says, which vary widely in depth of insight and substantive truth are to be found the stoic reinterpretation of man to whom the polis has become meaningless as the polites, citizen of the cosmos, right? The stoic idea that one is a citizen of the cosmos and that much of the vagaries of the human condition are of no concern because what's most important is one's own repose within internal repose. The Polybian vision of pragmatic ecumen destined to be created by Rome, the mystery religions, the Heliopolitan slave cults, Hebrew apocalyptic, apocalyptic, you know, theology, the idea that, you know, we're waiting for the end times, Christianity also, and Manichaeism which is this religion in which the world is seen as basically a battle between the equal forces of good and evil. Some of these I don't know much about, others I do, um, but what ties them all together is that they were all attempts to grapple with this new, violent, unpredictable world where the individual really didn't have any way of controlling their fate or felt like it. Um, and they appealed to people's sense of, of internal uh, improvement of, of like uh, within themselves, growing stronger, more secure, finding their peace within what they could control. And he says in this sequence, as one of the most grandiose of the new formulations of the meaning existing existence, 
belongs Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a first and second century born Judeo-Christian movement um, that, you know, was born, he says, of the same impulse to try to gain real wisdom, wisdom through this spiritual context of Judaism and Christianity um, that would then allow people to have some control again over their fate, both in this world and in the next, and to redirect their um, mental energies into that pursuit. This movement was denounced as not orthodox by the early Christian church, but that didn't stop it, and it continued to wax and wane over the centuries. Um, so the common thread, he says, that runs through Gnostic and Gnostic adjacent movements is that the experience of the world as an alien place into which man has strayed and from which he must find his way back home to the other world of his origin. That's the common experience that you feel that you are living in an alien place. It is not your home. Your home is elsewhere, and the knowledge that is necessary is that to get you back to that place where you feel the peace and the belonging that you imagine that's that's instilled within you. Um, he says the world from this perspective is no longer the well-ordered, the cosmos in which Hellenic man felt at home, nor is it the Judeo-Christian world that God created and found good. Gnostic man no longer wishes to perceive in admiration the intrinsic order of the cosmos. For him, the world has become a prison from which he wants to escape. So the secret knowledge of the Gnostics is supposed to allow them to escape from that prison, at least mentally and spiritually, not just in the next life with death, but even now. And so that, I think, looked to the early church to be a claim for too much power for human reason or human wisdom, as opposed to God's wisdom and God's time. Um, so, you know, you can see that he's developing this ancient notion of, of Gnosticism and telling you about it because he feels as though the same impulse is wor as at work in modern times. And he, in this introduction, he goes on to say, we no longer recognize it for what it is, but this is what it is. In, in effect, people's reaction to the utter chaos of the world and their inability to get a grip on things. And I would go so far as to say that in the 21st century, we are very much dealing with what Vogelin would call Gnosticism in some of the, um, the political movements of our day that are um, sort of in the conspiracy zone, um, you know, but any really any ideological movement that says we have the key, you know, the absolute truth, the sort of key that if you turn it and unlock it, everything will fit together. All the pieces of the puzzle will come into place and you will know the absolute truth um, is bordering Gnostic in, in Vogelin's um, sense of the term. Um, and so he says, still in the introduction, um, I'll cover like the next um, essay next week, but he says, from this attitude springs the programmatic formula of Gnosticism. Gnosis is the knowledge of who we were and what we became, of where we were and where into we have been flung, of where to we are hastening and where from we are redeemed, of what birth is and what rebirth so that there's the introduction of the idea of rebirth and uh, flungness, right? It's an interesting concept of the human condition to be thrown or flung into the world, to not have control over where and when you will be, to fully understand that um, the context in which you are born greatly, if not 100%, affects every aspect of your life, and you don't have any control over that. From that position, from that conscious position, uh, people long for rebirth, for a return to Eden in a way, okay? Or as he puts it, an escape from the world. They want the means of deliverance. And Gnosticism gives the secret language that delivers, 
Okay. So he says, finally, in this intro, the aim always is the destruction of the old world and passage to the new. The instrument of salvation is gnosis itself, which is knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge. So um, that is the content of the introduction that sets up the uh, book. And then the first essay is called Science, Politics, and Gnosticism. 